Hello, Wonder Hussy here. Out in the middle of nowhere at the scene of a terrible crime. Okay, I'm in the middle of one of the most desolate valleys in the entire continental United States, but I can't tell you the name of it because I've been told never to say the name of this valley on social media. So we're just gonna call it Secret Valley. Anyway, in this vast and mysterious Secret Valley, there happens to be a giant salt lake. You can see it gleaming in the distance, that brilliant white salt. Well, back in the day when the first white settlers came into this Secret Valley and discovered this juicy, juicy salt deposit, well, in the finest tradition of Western Europeans, they set about figuring out a way to harvest it. They wanted to get that delicious table salt, which back over a hundred years ago was also used to preserve foods. Remember that was before they had refrigeration. So salt was used to preserve meat. Anyway, they wanted to figure out a way to extract that salt and get it, well, back out to where all the people lived. And there was only one problem between the salt and where all the people lived was this giant range of towering mountains. The Inyo Mountains, I-N-Y-O. A very well-known and very formidable mountain range with peaks going as high as, oh gosh, don't quote me on it, but probably 10, 11,000 feet. It's no joke. So how were these industrious white guys supposed to harvest the salt out of this lake bed, but then get it back to where all the people lived on the other side of the mountains. Well, say what you will about the white man, they're nothing if not industrious. And so they devised a system whereby they built a tramway to load the salt into these giant buckets and then carry them on these cables all the way up and over the mighty Inyo Mountains to the other side where they were loaded onto a steamship that went across what was once a lake and that's a whole other story, to the railroad where it was then shipped to Los Angeles and all those people that needed salt. And this tramway was quite a feat of engineering. It says here it was a 13.4 mile tramway that ascended 7,600 feet up the eastern slope of the Inyos and then down 5,100 feet to the other side. Like I said, say what you will about the white man, he ain't lazy. Anyway, construction of this tramway began in 1911, over a hundred years ago. It was finished in 1913, but it only operated for about 17 years. That's right, by 1930, the whole thing was already defunct. And they don't really go into detail on this sign as to why. It just says, the operation was a brief success, but financial and legal problems forced it to change hands several times. So anyway, the whole thing only operated for 17 years. But the evidence of this tramway, the historical record of this tramway, is still visible out here. Okay, this is a very arid environment, meaning very dry, and so stuff doesn't rot away like it would in a more humid environment. So you can see, way out there in the distance, there's still tramway towers standing over a hundred years later. And as a matter of fact, there's not just tramway towers on the lake bed itself, there's still tramway towers going up and over the mountains. And I made a video years ago where I hiked from the top where the tramway operator had a cabin. I hiked about halfway down the face of these Inyo Mountains to where they had sort of like a halfway station for the tram. And there was still a tower there with, I think some of the buckets were still there. There was a whole bunch of artifacts left. Anyway, you can watch that video I made. I thought it was absolutely fascinating. And I think it is really cool that there are still bits and pieces of something that operated over a hundred years ago that you can go poke around today. That's pretty rare. You know, in today's world with all the hustle and bustle of progress, stuff usually just ends up getting bulldozed and paved over to make way for ticky tacky little houses and shopping centers, server farms, Bitcoin mining operations, all kinds of stuff. Well, not out here in this 
remote secret valley because it is so remote and so desolate and so hot and arid. I guess nobody wanted to develop anything here. And well, these tram pillars are still standing over a hundred years later, or that is most of them are still standing a hundred years later. Okay. This story has been all over the news in the past couple of weeks. And I'm not really sure what to think of it. So maybe the thing to do would be to get back in the car, in the blessed air conditioning, and drive down the road to check out these salt tram towers up close and personal. And I can tell you the rest of the story that way. Okay, we're here. Uh, I'm not even gonna cut my engine because it's so freaking hot out here. It's like, 100 degrees already and it's only like one o'clock in the afternoon i want to keep the interior cool and make sure i can get out of here anyway dun 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 this is the scene of one of the most horrific crimes committed by humanity in recent memory or at least that's what you might think judging from the amount of outrage on the internet i know imagine that outrage on the internet Okay, well, apparently what happened was some idiot vandalized this hundred plus year old tramway tower just to be a dick. <laughs> well, that's what you would think, judging by the headlines of all these news articles that have been shared on social media lately. I guess, as with all hot button topics, there's actually much more nuance to the story. And that's where the Wonder Hussy channel comes in, a channel that wallows in the murky waters of nuance. Okay, well, I'm just gonna present the facts to you and maybe you can decide for yourself what you think. Okay, so there was this salt tram tower, which until a couple few weeks ago was standing upright, just like its brethren farther down the road, until one day some off-roading jackass got stuck in the mud over there and tied his winch to one of these tram towers to try and pull himself out and ended up toppling, nay, destroying a historic artifact. And I'm not even being facetious. Under the Antiquities Act, which is a federal act protecting anything laying on the ground for longer than 50 years, this really was, is a protected historic artifact. And so, yeah, this guy really should have thought before of fixing his winch. I guess you don't really tie a winch. He looped his winch cable around it somehow. Anyway, he probably should have thought about that before he did it. But I ask you to put yourself in this dude's shoes. I mean, you're out here in this very barren, desolate landscape. You're bogged down in this thick ooey gooey mud. And this was, I think this happened in late April. So a little over a month ago, it probably wasn't quite as dry out here, nor as hot, but still a predicament that you want to get out of as fast as possible. What would you do? I mean, didn't Jesus say, let he who is without sin cast the first stone? Who among us hasn't gotten in a jam and done something, uh, well, a little fishy to get out of it? Now, I don't want to totally defend this guy because I actually do think he was being a pretty big jackass because he clearly drove way beyond the point where you're supposed to drive. I mean, you can see here, I stopped my car. Where you're legally supposed to, there's these signs that say clear as day, no motor vehicles beyond this point. And there's one here and there's one over there and there's one over there. It's pretty well marked. You're not supposed to drive any closer to the dang salt lake because they know that you're probably gonna get stuck. The ground becomes very squishy the farther you walk out there. And I've walked out there before. I know I speak from firsthand experience. Well, they don't want you getting stuck out there because if you do get stuck out here, there's no cell signal, forget about Wi-Fi. And even if you do have a satellite phone or somehow manage to flag down a passing motorist, well, the nearest towing company is all the way, on the other side of the mountains in Lone Pine, California, and they'll charge you, I would estimate probably about $10,000 to drive all the way out here. 
and tow you out. And so the park service doesn't want that happening. So they put up all these signs, just nicely asking people to please not drive out here. But you know how some people are, they don't like the government telling them what to do. And you know, I don't like the government telling me what to do either. You know, like if I want to take mushrooms, well, by golly, I want to take mushrooms. But sometimes, I hate to say this, sometimes the government actually knows what they're talking about and they put these prohibitions in place for a reason. I mean, you can kind of see what happened here. It's like reading the clues at a crime scene. So the guy probably drove out to the edge of the lake to, I don't know, look at it or whatever. For whatever reason, it looks like he drove over here. <laughs> and this is where he became bogged down. And it's interesting because the mud, like the ruts that he caused, you can see he was really stuck. But look how it's all already turning white. The salt crystals are rising to the surface. Look, footprints, a clue. Could these be the footprints of the terrible vandal who purposely vandalized this historic salt tram tower? Well, this gives us the perfect opportunity to literally put ourselves in his shoes. Okay, so we're, he was with his girlfriend. He was off-roading, probably trying to show off for a girl. Took a turn, went too far, got bogged down. Oh no, now what's he gonna do? Well, they don't wanna spend the night out here. So they gotta try to get out. So close, there's no trees around here. The closest structure, the only structure is this salt tram tower. And I don't think he expected it to fall over. You know, that, that's why I get so heated up about this is everyone's calling the dude a vandal. Well, he wasn't purposely vandalizing it. He just, he was a dumbass and a scofflaw, but I wouldn't call him a vandal, okay? He, affixed his winch to that thing, tried to pull himself out, and the dang tower just toppled right over. And I'll bet you anything, when that tower fell over, that guy went, oh, shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because now, not only is he stuck, but he also just defaced national park property. We're in a national park, Death Valley. Uh, but also, now what's he gonna do? How's he gonna get out? There's nothing else out here that he could tie his winch to. And there's not exactly a ton of traffic passing through this valley, but lucky for this dude, back five weeks ago when this happened, there was more traffic passing through this valley. As a matter of fact, I myself happened to be in this valley when all this happened. I was about five, 10 miles over that way uh, at an undisclosed location, having a fine time. I didn't know any of this was going on. Oh, well, anyway, my point is that five, six weeks ago, it wasn't as hot out here and so there were more cars passing by on this lonely road. I mean, when I say more cars, I really just mean more than zero. Like I've been driving on this road all day today and I passed one car and even that was a surprise. I mean, when I say this is a desolate area, I'm not kidding. This is literally one of the most desolate valleys in the entire lower 48. So now what's this guy gonna do? Well, there's the occasional car passing by. So his best hope is to go down to the main road here at the end of this little spur that we came down and try to flag down the next passing vehicle for help. And now this dude might have been a dumbass for getting stuck out here, but he wasn't a total dumbass. He didn't go stand at the side of the road. No, sir, he sent his girlfriend to go stand at the side of the road. And moreover, his girlfriend happened to be wearing little Daisy Duke shorts and a little crop top. Maybe she wasn't wearing that to begin with. Maybe he told her, you know, hey, honey, put on something sexy and go stand on the road. We need help. I don't know. All I know is she walked all the way down to the main road in her little outfit and waved down the next passing vehicle, who happened to be some off-roading dude who was well-equipped and agreeable, which it's kind of the off-roader code. If you're out in a super desolate area like this and someone flags you down for help, you don't just keep driving, you know? Like, of course, in the city, you city folk watching this, you might go, well, I would never stop for some random stranger at the side of the road waving me down. You know, they're gonna carjack me or rob me. Well, out here in the back country, no, you help others out because like I've already said about 10 times in this video, this is very, very desolate and it's very dry and very hot most of the year. So it's, it's not conditions that you wanna just leave somebody standing by the side of the road. So when you see someone waving for help, you stop which especially I guess if it's a gal and short shorts and a little halter top you definitely stop well this guy stopped and I guess the girl was like help we're stuck in the mud can you help tow us out and the guy said sure no problem I'll help tow you out <laughs> so I'm guessing the girl climbed into the other guy's rig and they drove down here to the scene of the crime 
where presumably this good Samaritan, maybe he had a winch of his own, it's probably what happened, and so he hooked his winch onto the stuck vehicle and was able to finally pull it out of the mud onto, well, relative terra firma. And then the guy and his girlfriend were able to continue on the raid. And I'm sure they thanked him profusely. Maybe they even offered him some money or beer. I don't know, I wasn't there. The only way I know any of this is because it became this huge thing on social media. There was so much outrage over this vandalized salt tower that this story was everywhere. Now you might be wondering, well, how do we know the details of this story? I mean, did the guy actually turn himself in? Well, no, as a matter of fact, he didn't, or at least not yet. Uh, I guess the park service must have been out here just doing one of their routine checkups. I'm not sure. And they discovered that this tower had fallen over. And it doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to figure out that somebody had been stuck and had to winch themselves out by using it. And that's what knocked it over right? I mean, like I said, there's ample crime scene evidence showing that a vehicle was stuck and there's all kind of footprints all around it of the guy trying to figure out what to do. And there's tire tracks crisscrossing every which way. They really tore this part of the lake bed up. So this park service sleuth came out here, figured out what had happened. And now he had to try and figure out who to blame or who to charge for the damage. And so I guess the park service they know all about YouTube, and so I guess he went on YouTube just to see if there was any, you know, videos relating to the salt tram towers it uploaded in the past few weeks. And sure enough, wouldn't you know, the good Samaritan who came to tow them out had a dash cam running the whole time, like a GoPro. And so he recorded the whole thing. I don't know if the guy who was extracted knew about it or if his girlfriend knew about it, but all of this was on GoPro, and I think the guy was even narrating as he's driving along. Dun dun dun, driving through this remote and mysterious secret valley. Oh, there's a girl at the side of the road, and Daisy Dukes, and she's waving for help. Okay, let's see what she wants. Hey, what do you need? Help, we're stuck in the mud, can you come tow us out? Sure, no problem, honey, hop in. Well, maybe he didn't call her honey, I don't know. I'm making all this up, I don't know, because unfortunately we can't see that video anymore. Okay, this guy did record the whole thing, and he did upload it to YouTube, and the park service employee, whose job it is to scan YouTube and TikTok for this kind of stuff, found it and downloaded it <laughs> right before the guy thought better of it and took it down. That's right, I guess the Good Samaritan took that video down after a few days because I guess if, you know, I'm thinking like he would have been thinking, he was probably afraid people would blame him for knocking over this tower. Which, I mean, again, I wasn't there, I don't know for sure, but it sounds to me like the first guy pulled the tower over. The second guy was just driving merrily along, was just trying to do a good deed and help them get out. But he probably thought to himself, knowing how these online outrage mobs are, that he didn't want to have any affiliation with this whole mess, and so he took the video off YouTube. <laughs> but unfortunately for him, the Park Service had already downloaded that video and they were able to pull some screen captures from it, some still photos of the guy's truck stuck in the mud, the guy himself, and his girlfriend. And so of course, you can guess what happened next. These images were posted all over Instagram and Facebook and please, if anyone recognizes the people in these photos who were responsible for vandalizing this 100 year old antiquity, Please notify the authorities. And you know how these online mobs get, I mean, I personally think it's, I get it, it's like, it's a good way to solve a crime. And in this case it worked, which I'll get to in a minute, but it's, there's just something distasteful about these rabid mobs on Instagram and Facebook. Who, I mean, you read in the comments section what they were saying about this guy and it's like, golly. You know, the whole concept of tourons is trending right now. Tourons being tourists acting like morons in national parks. Like the guys you see who fall into the hot springs up at Yellowstone that you're not supposed to go in, or the people who approach bison at Yellowstone even though they tell you not to approach bison. All those kinds of pictures have been going viral online with everybody in the comments basically screaming that they should be burned at the stake. That kind of thing. Well, same thing happened here. Ha, that guy's giving off-roaders a bad name, blah, blah, blah. Like some people in the comments going, see, that's what happens when you allow off-roading. All these roads should be closed. Now all the off-roaders are all freaked out. Oh, I knew this one bad apple's gonna 
ruin it for all of us. There's a lot of off-roaders who are still salty to this day about Jimmy Carter <laughs> back in the 70s, passing some act that closed a lot of off-roading trails in Death Valley. So off-roading is kind of a hot button topic and this whole thing really pushed a lot of buttons. <laughs> I guess a lot of hot buttons, you might say. Wow, it's interesting walking around this thing. You can see that it really was. I mean, it was stuck in there for over a hundred years and they, like I said, built it to last, but the force, and I'm not good at physics, but the force of <laughs> him trying to pull himself out of that mud patch using that thing ripped it clean out. I mean, look at that. That was even like a concrete foundation. Came right out of the ground, snapped the timber, and well, <laughs> the rest is history. So now the story's going around Facebook, Instagram, and I can't tell you how many people emailed me links to various news articles about it. I mean, people were just really heated up about this historic tram tower. And I do understand. I mean, I'm a big history buff if you've watched any of my videos. I love history. I love the fact that we can still enjoy stuff like this. But at the same time, it's like, golly, I mean, resource extraction in a national park. I mean, half these hippies that were yelling on this on these posts are violently opposed to any of these lithium mining proposals that are coming up now or any kind of mine. There was a conglomerate Mesa project planned up here. Oh, boo, mining is terrible. And this is essentially just junk left behind from a mining operation a hundred years ago. But it's like, why are you guys so fired up about it? I mean, if some mining company wanted to come in now, you wouldn't allow that. I mean, some of these people don't even want you to build rock towers to mark hiking trails. I mean, people are bonkers about man's footprint on these natural areas. So I just found it a little bit puzzling that some of these same people were so up in arms about this tower getting knocked over. I mean, let's just put things in perspective for a minute. I mean, what all do we have going on right now? Israel and Gaza and the Ukraine and Russia and bird flu, swine flu. There's all kinds of horrible stuff going on in the world. I don't understand why everybody was so outraged about, I'm probably making a ton of enemies saying this, but I mean, a rusty splintered old salt tram tower? Really? But again, I really do appreciate the history of these things. And you know, like I said, the whole fact of how they went up and over the mountains. And I feel like I'm in a better position than most to speak on this topic because how many of you watching have actually hiked halfway down those dang mountains to that halfway station? I'll bet not many. So I'm very intimately familiar with this whole project, whatever you want to call it. And it, it is, it's fascinating. And I like the fact that these towers are still standing today and you can go see them. But I mean, do I think this guy should be burned at the stake for knocking one of them over? Gosh, I don't know. And I guess we'll find out what happens because sure enough, once the pictures made the rounds of the internet, the guy's identity was revealed. And no, somebody didn't rat him out, surprisingly, or maybe somebody did rat him out, but he turned himself in first. I think the pictures had already started making the rounds, the, uh, just the, the pictures of the top of the tower, not the screen caps. I think he turned himself in before the screen caps even came out because maybe he did know the guy had a dash cam running and he's just sort of figured that he was probably gonna end up getting busted. And so it would be better for him in the long run if he just went ahead and turned himself in, which is what he did. And I think that's the honorable move to make. Uh, I'm sure he's facing all manner of fines. I mean, first and foremost, illegally off-roading past a very clearly marked sign saying no motor vehicles. There's a fine for that. There's a pretty substantial fine for vandalizing. And again, I take issue with the term vandalizing, but destroying, destroying park property. So that's a second charge. Destroying an antiquity. I guess it's probably some violation of the Antiquities Act. Uh, I don't know. He's probably going to get billed for the cost of restoration because yes, believe it or not, even with Ukraine and people starving and obesity and this and that, the park service is using funds from the Inflation Reduction Act to restore this tower. That's what I read online. They said they were going to use funds allocated to the park service for the 
or from the Inflation Reduction Act to fix this old salt tram tower. And please, if I'm getting that wrong, let us know in the comments, but that was my understanding from the articles I read. I don't understand what fixing an old salt tram tower has to do with reducing inflation, but hey, it's not my park and it's not my budget. So I have no say in how they wanna address this issue. I just came out here. And by the way, uh, when I say I just came out here, it's not like I just came out here. This is an, a real expedition to get out here. This valley is so vast, so desolate and so rugged. And there's really only two ways in and out. And neither one of them is a cakewalk. I could come in that way. It's 50 miles of washboard and bumpy rocks. Or as it happened, I did, I came in that way, which was also 50 miles of washboard and bumpy rocks. It was a long drive. I could only go about 10, 15 miles an hour for the whole thing. And so not only is it gonna take me all day to make this video, it's going to be a very expensive video too, because it's probably gonna take me almost a whole tank of gas. But I wanted to do it anyway, just because I think it's such an interesting story with so much delicious nuance. There's that word again, nuance. In case you're not familiar with the term nuance, it means the gray areas, the in-betweens. Like nothing is either completely right or wrong or good or bad. Well, unless you're talking about an old Western movie. In the good old days, there were clearly delineated bad guys and good guys. And well, we just knew where we stood on everything. Nowadays, well, there's more nuance or at least there is for people like me, I can always see that there's not always a clear-cut bad guy and a clear-cut good guy. Like this, okay, we'll go ahead and call him a jackass. This jackass clearly was kind of a dick for ignoring the off-roading signs. And then, I mean, he must have known he would probably damage this tower when he hooked his thing to it. But in his defense, he was desperate. You know, this could be a survival situation out here. And he had the girl with him or the woman and you know now he feels responsible for her too he got them into this jam i don't know man i guess i see both sides of this subject and that's why i'll never be a super successful youtuber or politician or anything because i'm just too <laughs> nuanced so i don't know what do you guys think let me know in the comments below if you think this guy should be fined and or imprisoned within an inch of his life, or if he just made an honest mistake and everybody just needs to back off, or if you're like me, I feel like there should be just sort of some sort of in-between. I feel like he should have to pay, he, he should have to pay for the restoration of the tower, not the Inflation Reduction Act, which by the way is tax money collected from us, the taxpayers. Well, I don't feel like I should have to pay for restoring this salt tram tower. A, I'm not really sure I care about it that much. And B, I'm not the one who damaged it. So I think that dude should have to pay out of his own pocket or, you know, maybe he can start a GoFundMe or something. But he should have to pay for the restoration costs. But then again, you know how that goes. I mean, it's not like they're just going to go to Home Depot and hire a contractor to come out here and, you know, tilt it back up and bolt it back into the ground. No, they're going to have to have historians and archaeologists. And there's probably even going to have to be a biologist or three come out and make sure there's no endangered species in the area. And then the historian's going to have to make sure that whatever wood and nails they use are historically authentic. And then the archaeologist is going to have to make sure that he puts it back up exactly the right way. And all of that is going to be very, very expensive. So I guess I feel that that guy should have to also pay for the archaeologists, the historians, and the biologists, and who all ever else the Park Service deems necessary to do a thorough and proper restoration effort. And golly, that's probably going to be in the tens of thousands of dollars. I wouldn't be surprised to say. Okay, so now the question is, what can we learn from this boondoggle? Well, the first thing we can learn is to pay attention to the signs indicating no motorized vehicles. Okay, if a road is closed, that means it's closed and probably for a good reason. And the second thing we can learn is that you should familiarize yourself with what to do if you get stuck in a jam like this. Okay, the guy was evidently a relatively seasoned off-roader if he had a winch with him. And yeah, I know there's a lot of those overlanders that have like the fancy decked out overlanding SUV with the snorkel and the max tracks on the side and the trash bag hanging on the back. And 
a winch on the front that they'll probably never use. Well, let's just assume that he did know how to use the winch. He just didn't, uh, didn't understand physics and forces. And so I guess that's another thing we can learn. I was reading online, guys were saying, well, what he should have done and what you can do if you get stuck and you have a winch, but you get stuck in a place where there's no trees or anything to pull yourself out by, well, you can bury your spare tire. So they were saying he should have dug a hole, buried his spare tire with the winch cable attached to that. And then somehow, I guess, depending on how deep you bury it or how far away you bury it, that does provide enough resistance. I'm probably not using the right terminology because I don't understand this myself, but he would have been able to pull himself out just using his own spare tire. And yeah, his spare tire would have gotten all muddy and nasty, but guess what? I bet he would gladly sacrifice that spare tire if it would have saved him from all the hullabaloo and humiliation he faced because of this incident. And I say hole of blue is actually probably worse than that. I mean, I feel like this is something people would lose their jobs over. I mean, the guy's name hasn't come out. They haven't uh, released his name. And I think that's a good thing because he came forward. He turned himself in. I mean, the guy's doing what he can, I guess. So why, you know, put him publicly in the stocks, so to speak, you know, if they release his name, then his employer is going to start getting all these threatening phone calls. I don't know. Maybe I'm exaggerating. I know that if it was, if he did something to an animal, people would really lose their, you know what? I guess salt tram towers, maybe people aren't quite as passionate about. But you know what I mean, if his name was released, he would almost certainly suffer some measure of online harassment. And well, I guess the park service is trying to spare him that fate, which I actually think is pretty darn classy. Probably the classiest thing in this whole story which doesn't really have a whole lot of class. Oh, hey, I just noticed uh, over here on the passenger side of the vehicle, I guess. Well, you can see it looks like his girlfriend's footprints. It's like she was walking around barefoot, but then you can also see dog footprints. So apparently he also had an off leash dog in a national park. How about that? You know, people with their dogs. I've encountered so many off leash dogs in my time in national parks that, gosh, I don't even, I guess it doesn't even really bother me anymore, but it is kind of rude and kind of gross. Now all the dog people are gonna hate me, but you know, that's one other thing I can say against this dude. Not only was he illegally off-roading, but he was also letting his dog run around off leash, which is also against the rules. So two strikes against him. Maybe they should go ahead and just burn him at the stake, or at the very least, publicly humiliate him. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. I feel like I said, as long as he pays for everything and it doesn't have to come out of my pocket, hey, I'm okay with that. And I have really good faith that these historians and antiquarians will restore this salt tram tower to its former glory. And in fact, it'll probably be resurrected even better than it was before. I guess I'll have to come back out here in a year or so and see for myself. Anyway, that's pretty much all there is to the great salt tram tower controversy of 2024. I'm going to go ahead and get back in my car in the air conditioning and hopefully make it out of this valley again without busting a tire, overheating, or otherwise breaking down. Because wouldn't that be the most embarrassing irony of all? If some ninny YouTuber had to be rescued from the site of the toppled salt tram.